Welcome to the 2016 conference of the Mormon Transhumanist Association. My name is Lincoln Cannon. I am a director and founder of this association and I've served as its president for the last 10 years. Three years ago at this conference, the renowned historian of Mormon origins, Richard Bushman, spoke here and he proposed that the mission of this association is to take the place of B.H. Roberts and John Witso. Roberts and Witso are now long deceased, but they were Mormon apostles who were champions of science. In 1908, Witso published a book. It was entitled Joseph Smith as Scientist. And in it, he claimed that truth is truth forever. Scientific truth cannot be theological lie. And then of similar mind, Roberts wrote in 1931 that to pay attention to and give reasonable credence to science is to link the church of God with the highest increase of human thought and effort. Of course, Roberts and Witso weren't the first Mormon apostles to champion science. One of their predecessors was Parley Pratt, who was among the first 12 Mormon apostles organized by Joseph Smith. In 1855, Parley published a book entitled The Key to the Science of Theology, and that's precisely what he considered the potential of theology to be, a science. And uh, I'd like to read to you the first words from his book, the preface of that book. I think that you'll find that these words are words that will resonate with just about any transhumanist, Mormon or otherwise. Here are his words. The present is an age of progress, of change, of rapid advance and wonderful revolutions. The very foundations of society, social, political, commercial, moral, and religious, seem to be shaken as with a mighty earthquake from center to circumference. All things tremble. Creation groans, the world is in travail, and pains to be delivered. A new era has dawned upon our planet and is advancing with accelerated force, with giant strides. The railroads and the steamboats, with their progressive improvements in speed, safety, and convenience, are extending and multiplying the means of travel, of trade, of association, and intercommunication between countries whose inhabitants have been comparatively unknown to or estranged from each other. But, as if even these means were too slow for the godlike aspirations, the mighty throes of human thought, and its struggles for light and expansion, humanity seizes the lightning, tames and subdues it, and makes it the bearer of its thoughts and dispatches. While these things are in progress by one portion of humanity, another learns to seize and control a sunbeam in a manner subservient to the progress of the fine arts, and by which means one performs in a minute the work which a short time since would have employed the most active years of a lifetime. Those are the words of Parley Pratt that he used to introduce what is, in his estimation, a science of theology, and what was, in his estimation, the heart of Mormonism. Another Mormon apostle that championed science was James Talmadge. He was a contemporary of Roberts and Widso, and echoing Pratt in 1899, Talmadge wrote these words. To count the ticking of a watch thousands of miles away. To speak in but an ordinary tone and be heard across the continent. To signal from one hemisphere and be understood on the other, though oceans roll and roar between. To bring the lightning into our homes and make it serve as fire and torch to navigate the air and to travel beneath the ocean surface, to make chemical and atomic energies obey our will. Remember, this is 1899. Are not these miracles? At some point in his life, Talmadge had acquired a copy of Pratt's book, The Key to the Science of Theology. And I happen to know that because I have the book here with me today. I received this book from my step-grandfather, 
and um, he, his name was Wayne Wiscombe. He was married to Helen Brandley Wiscombe as his first wife. When she died, he inherited it, and he gave it to me. Um, she was the granddaughter of uh, Talmadge. And inside the front cover of this book is the stamp of Talmadge's personal library. He had acquired it from the Deseret News Corporation at some point in his life. For me, this book embodies Mormon transhumanism for a few reasons. First of all, both Mormon transhumanism in this book advocate the ethical use of technology and religion to extend human abilities. Second, both envision a future of unlimited human potential in compassion and creation. And third, both are an inheritance from past champions of science that were inspired by their Christian discipleship. And then finally, one of the reasons why this book embodies Mormon transhumanism for me is that today both the association and this book are going to move on to their next caretaker. A few months ago, I told the board of directors of the association that I felt it was time for us to have a new president. While I admit to some sadness in telling them that, I believe that 10 years is long enough for anyone to be the leader of an organization like ours. As transhumanists, we know better than most that change is essential to progress. And as religious transhumanists, we know better than most that change is too often resisted most when it's needed most. So last month, the other board members and I, all of us democratically elected to represent the voting members of the association, we met together to select a new president, and the outcome was a unanimous vote for Christopher Bradford. I'm, I'm proud to call Chris my friend. Uh, over 15 years ago, he and I met in online philosophy discussions at BeliefNet. It was a uh, forum. It's still around, but not as popular as it once was. And um, since that time, I've spent countless hours with Chris discussing just about every topic that I'm capable of imagining. Um, over, over the years, uh, he um, has been involved and I have been involved in each other's projects. We've worked together. Most importantly, uh, he was one of the 14 founders of the Mormon Transhumanist, Transhumanist Association, along with me and several other people in this room. He's also served as a director and vice president of the uh, Mormon Transhumanist Association, and he knows Mormonism and transhumanism and this association as well as anyone and better than most. Chris has my full support and confidence um, to be our new president, and uh, Chris, I'd like to invite you up with me. Chris, um, I'd like to give you the key to the science of theology. <laughs> and I trust that it will inspire you as it has inspired me. Uh, Chris and I are going to take questions uh, from you, that any questions you might have regarding the, the change in the leadership of the association or uh, regarding its past or its future, whatever you might have on your mind for, for the next few minutes. Um, and before we do that, I would like everyone, I would like to invite everyone to uh, show our appreciation to Lincoln for his leadership of the last time. Um, I figure we might as well, it's a, an appropriate moment for us to share with Lincoln a token of our appreciation. Um, we've... Uh, we're um, preparing for him a crystal seer stone engraved, engraved with um, the logo of the association and his tenure as president. Um, and I just want to express my own gratitude for Lincoln. Um, we've really looked up to him and um, gained so much from his leadership. It's been incredible to witness. Um, for me, uh, the way he empowers us and inspires us to um, take things and run with them and to grow personally has really been a life-changing experience for me, and I'm so grateful for his friendship.
That's in earnest of the actual gift, by the way. <laughs> May we answer any questions? and um, aims of the association. Yeah, so repeat question for the recording. What are the major duties and aims of the president of the association apart from the annual conference? So uh, the president of the association is uh, very much the public face of the organization in many ways. Um, and so there's participation in other conferences. Um, there, there's uh, participation in online forums. Um, we, we hold regular monthly meetups and uh, we're working right now on um, making those a little bit more structured and so helping people who are new to the ideas of the organization um, with introductory material, helping them kind of get their footing um, in what Mormon transhumanism is. Um, in addition, um, the Constitution uh, has the President acting also as the CEO of the organization. We have a separate management team that manages marketing, finances, and so forth, uh, legal affairs, and so the President also is responsible for uh, those regular meetings and for ensuring that we maintain our nonprofit status and all of those types of things as well. Does that sufficiently answer your question? <laughs> I will be sad if this happens, but can we expect uh, Lincoln to not be uh, as active in writing on a lot of different forums about Mormon transhumanism? And I'll be delighted to see is Chris going to be more active in <laughs> So the question was, should we expect to see Lincoln become less active in writing about Mormon transhumanism, and should we expect Chris to become more active in writing about Mormon transhumanism? Is that a fair restatement? Um, I'll only answer the first part of that question. I'll let Chris answer the second part. Uh, I suspect you will see me writing more about Mormon transhumanism going forward. When, when running the association, a lot of time and effort goes into uh, tasks behind the scenes where you know there are websites and conferences and all sorts of things to organize and run and make sure are operating effectively and efficiently. And so the time that I have historically put into those sorts of things, I imagine will start going into uh, more writing about the, the MTA and Mormon transhumanism. In particular, um, I, I have three open invitations to write for some peer-reviewed uh, journals about Mormon transhumanism that I've not been able to satisfy, and I'll be working on all of those in the near future, and those should be available, hopefully. And I think they'll be good tools for the association once, once they are available. So I think the answer to your question is that you should expect more of the writing about Mormon transhumanism from me. And I can address the second part of the question. Uh, yes, you, will, you should expect to see more from me, in particular in online forums. Um, my my uh, public involvement with Mormon transhumanism has been less online and more in conferences. In the last 12 months, I've presented at four different conferences on Mormon transhumanist topics. Um, but I do have plans to be more active in the online forums, and uh, I have a number of things in the works that you'll see coming soon. Other questions? Any uh, parting advice you want to share with the group? Well, I'm not going to go away, so it's not that sort of parting advice. But uh, parting advice, perhaps, as, as, a, um, as having been the leader of the organization. I wrote a blog post about this uh, a month or two ago. And one of, one of the things that comes to mind as you ask the question is my, is my experience with interacting with others, both Mormons and non-Mormons, about Mormon transhumanism and the types of reactions we get and what my opinion is about good ways to respond to those types of reactions. As prob probably most of you know, because I'm sure you, you've 
interacted about Mormon transhumanism with other people. We get a wide range of responses. We get very enthusiastic responses from some people, and you know, a lot of people are more, more likely to be, most people are probably more likely to be cautiously interested. Like, wow, that's kind of different, interesting. Um, and then, of course, there's the, su the subset of people, probably small but loud, that really, really dislike what we do. And of course, there are, there are two main types of those people. There are people who really dislike what we do because it runs counter to their understanding of religion, and they tend to think of us as the Antichrist or something like that. And then, of course, there are secular persons who t are quite anti-religious, generally, and we kind of epitomize the horrible like, effort to make religion persist in the face of their clear, dominant intellectual superiority. Um, and, and of course, the approach they take is one of ridicule, usually, where we're, we're stupid and not worth listening to. And so, so my advice regarding these things, and, and you know, my own mileage has varied in my ability to, to exemplify them, but my advice would be that a good sense of humor is good along the way. Um, it's probably not particularly, par particularly effective to demonize them in return, um, speaking of the r more religious fundamentalist types. And it's also probably not particularly useful to ridicule them in return. Although, I think it is worth saying um, why we believe that the positions we take are better than the positions that they are taking. Why we, why we believe that religious fundamentalism, sectarian fundamentalism, has detriments why we believe that secularism probably isn't the strongest way forward. Things like that I think are definitely worth saying. I don't think we should shy away from saying them, but I think that there are, that there are, I know that there are constructive and friendly ways to say these things. And so that, that I would, su I suppose is the advice I would give uh, to members of the association is to, to try to exemplify that friendly, constructive, but not frightened position of expressing, you know, the kind of religious vision, the kind of scientific and technological vision that, that the association stands for. All right, I think our time for questions is up. Um, thank you very much for being here this morning, and I'll turn the rest of the conference over to our excellent new president, Christopher Bradford.